Okay, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, so, uh, oh, and, uh, I guess I should first, I should apologize. The metaphysics exercise that's due tonight, um, I based it on an old one and I like edited the, I mean, I changed the question somewhat and I also edited the time it was due and I saved it and somehow like that change in the time it was due didn't take. So it said it was due May 20th, 2021. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I fixed it now. I hope that didn't cause too much uh, confusion. Anyway, um, I'm just gonna start talking about skepticism. Oops. Yes, wasn't the public time, but... Okay. Anyway, so skepticism is basically the view that we must or ought to suspend judgment about something that is not believed one way or the other. Um, Right, sorry, I'm thinking about something in Locke, but never mind that. All right, so and so uh, in part four of book one of the treatise, uh, it's basically about skepticism. Um, and Hume breaks it down into two parts. Skepticism about respect to reason and skepticism with respect to the senses. So, I mean, this, these two things are, at least we think they mean, this is um, arguments that you should suspend belief in cases where reason seems to lead you to believe something. That's what skepticism with respect to reason is. So like if reason leads you to believe that the uh, interior angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles, um, then uh, normally, so you would believe that because reason led you to believe it, but a skeptical argument is gonna be one that says, no, you shouldn't believe it or disbelieve it, right? Like if I tried to prove it was wrong, actually, that wouldn't be a skeptical argument. Um, but that's, well, that does come into some of Hume's arguments, which is part of the problem he has in the end. But in any case, so that's what we think this is supposed to mean. And on the other hand, we think this is supposed to mean when the senses lead you to believe something, skepticism with respect to the senses or about the senses would mean, um, I guess regard is what Hume says, with regard to reason or with regard to the senses, since skepticism with regard to the senses would be um, the senses lead you to believe something, but the skeptical argument says, no, you should suspend judgments. Um, now, um, it actually turns out to be more complicated than that or just different than that um, because, so first of all, um, in the section where he discusses this, which is um, uh, section one of book four, a uh, book one, section one of book four, one part four. <laughs> um, Hume uses reason in a somewhat broad sense to include, I think, two different things: demonstration. Well, and intuitive, rational belief. Um, so, I mean, this is also kind of an expansion, right? Like you might, like strictly speaking, reason is the faculty of, of drawing conclusions. So like, if you're certain of something immediately, that wouldn't count as by reason. But I think Hume is including that here, like, if you're correctly certain of something immediately, or at least, I mean,
what would be the right way to put this? I guess if it were like something that um, in rational demonstrations counts as a valid step. So right, like that counts as immediate certainty. Um, that's also going to be included in what Hume means by reason here, I think. But he also means um, conclusions about probability by quote unquote reasoning from uh, by cause and effect. Now, I mean, if we were talking about Locke, this wouldn't be a problem because Locke says explicitly reason is about both of these. Right, reason leads me to uh, certainty or knowledge in the case of demonstrative arguments, and it leads me to judgments of probability in the case of probable arguments. And um, I guess Locke agrees, although he does not stress this anywhere, that those probable arguments always involve reasoning um, by cause and effect. Um, but for Hume, this is actually a little bit tricky because he really doesn't think the faculty of reason, strictly speaking, is involved in these reasonings by cause and effect, right? We saw that in the uh, reading from the first inquiry, and he says the same thing in the treatise, um, that uh, the, the faculty that's involved here is really the imagination. So when he says skepticism with regard to reason, it, it turns out to be with regard to reason, strictly speaking, and also um, what we normally think of as reasoning from cause and effect. But it's not really reasoning according to him. It's really an effect of the imagination, right? It's due to custom. Um, and actually, the same thing is true with the second part. Um, um, so, right, this is basically about everything that Locke would call sensitive knowledge. Um, plus, I mean, I guess it even breaks down the same into the same two parts, right? There's like sensitive knowledge. And then there's like, well, Actually, now that I'm saying this, yeah, there may be some overlap between these two. It's kind of weird, but sensitive knowledge and also like um, our belief in the existence of remote objects, which doesn't come directly by the senses. So, like, you know, my belief that the um, stairs outside my house are still there. So when someone comes in through the door, I don't think that they must have floated up. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, that's not what Locke would call sensitive knowledge because I don't see them right now. Um, and, um, but the truth is, this distinction isn't that important for Hume because Hume thinks that our belief in both of these is really not due to the senses or reason, but the imagination. And he explains in section two of part four of book one, he explains how our belief in both of these really comes from the exact same process of the imagination. Um, that is, um, my belief that what I'm seeing right now is an independent object that, um, would exist whether I was seeing it or not. That's basically the content of sensitive knowledge. And my belief that something I'm not seeing right now, nevertheless, is still there. Um, because it's an independent object that exists whether I see it or not. So, right, that's the first one is this, and the second one is this. And Hume says it's the same process of imagination that leads to both beliefs. Um, so, this is really skepticism about the imagination, so to speak. Um, um, 
Okay, I mean, that's kind of technical. I mean, um, Hume is, at least in the titles of the sections, is using, is like speaking with the vulgar, right? Like this, is, these are things that we normally think we get by reasoning versus things we normally think that we learn through our senses. But his analysis really shows that it's mostly the imagination that leads to beliefs. Okay, um, so anyway, those are the two things we're gonna be talking about. And um, as in all skepticism, the road to a general or radical doubt, I mean, or the argument in favor of a general radical doubt, suspension of belief, has to lie in using our opinions against each other. Right, because obviously if I want to, um, like let's say I want to cast doubt on everything that I think I know by, by means of reason or the senses. So I can't appeal to some outside standard. I can't say, um, well, uh, all those things are doubtful because X is true. Because how did I learn X? So, right, that is if, I mean, assuming that everything I think I know, I think I learned either by reason or the senses, um, that is either rationally or empirically, um, assuming that everything falls into at least one of these categories, uh, I'm trying to cast doubt on all of them. So I, they don't have like a firm, I can't like leave aside something that I'm gonna out external standard that I'm gonna use to, and I'm gonna apply to all of these to cast doubt on them. Instead, I have to use them against themselves somehow. Right, so skeptical arguments typically take the form of, um, uh, showing that our different beliefs undermine each other. Um, so, um, you know, this is, it's, this is Hume's answer to the objection that he discusses um, on page 237 in your text, but I'm gonna be, so I have my text here, um, but I, I'm gonna tell you the pages in the other one when I show something. So, um, so in mine, it's on page 125. This is the objection that Hume deals with at the end of section one. If the skeptical reasonings be strong, say they, that is the people who are raising the objection, tis a proof that reason may have some force and authority. If weak, they can never be sufficient to invalidate all the conclusions of our understanding. Right, so this is what would be true if, um, if this was gonna work by appealing to an outside standard, right? So that is, if there was an argument that we believe the conclusion of because of reason, and then we're gonna use that to show that all the other things we believe according to reason are doubtful. So like, that's not gonna succeed because we have to leave aside that reason is good for something, namely reaching that one conclusion we're using to cast everything else into doubt. Um, whereas on the other hand, if we let it cast doubt in itself as well, this is the objection, then we don't believe its conclusion. And so uh, we can't use it to cast doubt on everything else. Um, and Hume's response is that, um, he describes it as a process where 
the reason starts out strong and lends its authority to the skeptical argument, but the skeptical argument by its nature diminishes that authority. So it diminishes the general authority of reason and at the same time it diminishes its own authority, but it still has enough authority left to diminish the authority of reason in general a little bit more and so on and so forth until they both disappear at the same time. Now, I mean, um, I think uh, you can look at it that way because of the particular structure of the, of the argument Hume is gonna make here, which does um, involve like gradually diminishing the authority of reason one step, you know, step by step. But I mean, I don't think that's, it has to be a pro, uh, like a process for this to work. The point is just that, you know, if reason somehow provides an argument that the conclusions of reason are not to be believed, then, um, um, You'll be caught in a, in a contradiction if you try to believe all the conclusions of reason. So you know at least some of them are false. So now you have a reason to doubt all of them. That's that's like the general way a skeptical argument would work, but Hume's does have this more complicated series aspect to it. So I'm going to go on to talk about that in detail. Um, but are there questions before I go on? What was um, the contradiction that you would be caught in by only believing like arguments from reason? Well, so what I was saying is suppose reason produces, like gives its authority to a skeptical argument, right? I mean, the arguments we're making are gonna be using the regular procedures of argument. Like we're gonna be using reason and or this kind of thing about probability. But we're going to be using what Hume is calling reason here, right? So, um, so now we're going to assume that 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 some like legitimate use of that leads to the conclusion that you shouldn't necessarily believe in the conclusions of reason, right? So, if if you now try to believe that all the conclusions of reason are certain, they'll be caught in a contradiction because. I guess maybe I didn't say it right, but like if you if you take yourself to be certain about everything that is a result of reasoning, you'll be caught in a contradiction because one of the things that's a result of reasoning is that you shouldn't be certain about all the results of reasoning, right? So um, you that you can avoid the contradiction, however, by suspending your judgment about all the results of reasoning, and that's what you have to do. Um, right. So, um, okay, so now I'm going to talk though about how particularly, how in particular he does that in his argument for the first of these, which is also his argument in the first section of part, of part four. Um, So it starts with this, that um, suppose I make, um, to begin with, we're gonna be talking about an argument of reason in this strict sense, right? I have a demonstration that something is true. It's, you know, perhaps it's the demonstration that one plus one equals two. Um, um, assume that one plus one equals three involves a contradiction. Or, you know, maybe we should say two, well, whatever. What, suppose it's, it's the conclusion that one, problem with this is it may be a definition. So let me say, suppose it's the conclusion that two plus three equals five. Right. So, um, you have a, an argument that shows that taking two plus three to be anything other than five is a contradiction, so it must be five. Um, 
Hume says, but at that point, you can make a second reflective judgment. So, right, so judgment one, is about these numbers, two, three, and five. It's about a certain relationship between the numbers two, three, and five. And um, it has demonstrative certainty. As Hume would say, it's about relations of ideas. Um, so it's not about the supposed adequacy of those ideas to any outside object. It's just about the relation between the ideas themselves. That's why it's supposed to be perfectly certain. But now we make judgment two. And judgment two is, judgment one is probably correct. And it's reasonable to form a judgment like this because um, we know that sometimes we have um, thought we were carrying out a correct argument, but actually we made a mistake. So, um, so we like think back, it's called reflective, right? Because like we, we look back to the judgment we just made and we reflect on it and we say, okay, well, this judgment is the result of, or like seems to be the result of a legitimate use of the faculty of reason. Um, uh, if it is, it's certainly true, but I know that sometimes I've been misled and thought that I had made a valid argument when really I hadn't. Um, thought that I had, for example, done an arithmetic, arithmetic problem correctly when actually I made a mistake. So, um, so I, you know, after, when I made the judgment, I was absolutely certain, but then when I get to judgment two, I say, well, okay, it's very probable this is true. You don't usually go wrong about something that simple. That is, I don't usually go wrong about something that simple in my experience. But I could, it's not impossible. And so I'm gonna reduce my certainty in this result ever so slightly. I'm still pretty sure that two plus three equals five, but there's just some chance that I might've done it wrong. Um, and this second judgment is never, one of these. It's always one of these. It's always a judgment of probability about matters of fact, and it's based on reasoning about cause and effect. What's the cause and what's the effect? So um, this is on page 231 in your text. Our reason must be considered as a kind of cause of which truth is the natural effect, but such a one as by the eruption of other causes and by the inconstancy of our mental powers may frequently be prevented, right? Prevented meaning it may be um, impeded from having its natural effect. So this is a type of um, reasoning we make about cause and effect all the time, right? You know, we say, uh, um, I don't know, uh, there's a fire, so there'll be smoke. And then we say, well, the fire doesn't always produce smoke. That's its usual effect, but sometimes under special conditions, it doesn't produce smoke. So we're so it's so there's a fire. There's probably smoke would be the conclusion, right? And 
this it's the exact same thing we're doing here. The only difference is that the matter of fact is about our own mental process, but it's still a matter of fact. And we're still reaching a probable conclusion based on cause and effect, right? We're saying um, reason usually causes true conclusions, or I, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. That I mean, that is the way Hume says it, and it may be important, but it seems like it might be better to say the seeming use of reason usually produces true conclusions. I don't know. In any case, like what the cause that we think was operating here, we believe usually causes true conclusions, but we know that it doesn't always, that some other things can interfere under special conditions. It will cause false conclusions. Um, So it's a little bit like, I mean, because like Hume is going to go on to say that it's the very same principles that led to this judgment also lead to this judgment. And that's not exactly true. They, I mean, by his own theory, this one is about relation of ideas and this one is about cause and effect. So this one proceeds by reason, strictly, strictly speaking, whereas this one proceeds by the imagination. But um, um, it's this. It's the same principle in the sense that it's you know. Um, in both cases, we're only doing what we would always think of as as reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doubting, and so Hume, you know, like offers evidence that doubting the results of demonstrations, at least after the fact, is part of what we normally call reasonable. And we would, someone who doesn't do it would be considered unreasonable, right? Like, so for example, a mathematician, as he discusses the example of a mathematician, a mathematician has just completed some proof, presumably if it's something a little bit more difficult than two plus three equals five, a mathematician has just completed some jump proof. Um, are they certain that the theorem is true? Well, no, they have to go back and check their tab, their proof, right? I mean, it would be unreasonable for them to, you know, I just for the first time proved something. I wrote down some long proof. And now I say, okay, so I can be certain that's true and I'll go on to the next thing. Right, like that would be uh, arrogant and foolish and unreasonable. What I should do is first check my proof to make sure I didn't make a mistake. And then uh, Hume says, I'm still not completely sure until I show it to other people, uh, until I check it several times, I show it to other people, um, and I become even more sure if I publish it and everyone thinks it's a great proof. So um, that shows that uh, that I never had complete certainty, and presumably that even at the end I don't have complete certainty, right? I mean, it's become much more probable that it's true now because it's been published and no one has found a problem in it and whatever. But you know, everyone could be making a mistake, right? So. Um, so, so that, you know, that shows that, according to Hume, that it's reasonable once you reach a demonstrative conclusion to make this secondary judgment about how probable it is that it's true, how probable it is that the demonstration has been done correctly. And he also talks about our, you know, procedures of accounting that, like, or as he calls it, accounting, <laughs> that, um, that first of all, like, uh, you hire a trained accountant who's good at, I mean, re so remember, like, in those days, the accountant has to actually do all the additions <laughs> and whatever themselves. <laughs> so you hire a, a trained accountant who has a lot of experience in adding up long columns of numbers, so you can rely more on their answers than just someone off the street. But even that, you don't trust completely. You set up a whole complicated system where 
and I don't understand really how accounting system works, but there's like two columns and something, and I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, the, it provides a check, right? Like there's two numbers that are supposed to be the same, and if they're not, you know, there was a mistake somewhere or something like that. So, you know, um, uh, and the more important the result is, the more like procedures we're going to adopt to make sure there hasn't been a mistake. Well, Hume says, you know, so first of all, that obviously shows that we're not completely certain if rather than this single addition here, we had a long column of big numbers we were adding up. I mean, it's still a demonstration. Uh, but we're not completely certain of the result by any means, and it wouldn't be reasonable to completely be completely certain of the result. It would be unreasonable, right? So, and moreover, Hume says, well, what you do in adding up the long column of numbers is just do simple additions like this over and over, right? Like that's how we do addition. We have algorithms that involve just, so we can just add single digits, you know, carry the one and whatever, right? So, um, so every single step in adding up that long column numbers was like this. So if there could be a mistake in the whole thing, it must have been in at least one of the steps. <laughs> so that means we can't be completely certain about even simple additions like that either. Um, that is, we don't regard it as reasonable to be certain about them. Not sure if that's completely true. Maybe we, the mistake comes in like not remembering what the result was at the last step. I don't know. Anyway, that's the argument, right? Um, so, uh, so, so far, there's no general skeptical conclusion from this. Right? Because as I said, when I make this judgment, Normally, the judgment I'm going to make is it's really, really probable that that's the right answer. Maybe under really unusual circumstances, I'm really under pressure or whatever. Actually, so there's a story about this. I, you know, I was in astrophysics grad school before I went into philosophy, and we had oral general exams. So, like, you, you know, like the faculty members are all sitting there and they're asking you questions and you know giving you problems and you're trying to do them on the blackboard <laughs> and at some point i was added seven to five and got 13. <laughs> so they, and they were like yeah, you might want to check that <laughs> right so like in an unusual circumstance maybe uh this judgment we would really reduce our certainty substantially but normally it's it's negligible right um so this doesn't lead to any kind of general doubt it just leads to that is suspension of judgments right i not i don't say well two plus three could be five or it could not be five i'm suspending judgments i say two plus three is pretty certainly five but maybe maybe there's some chance it's not right um right so that so the initial conclusion and this is on page 232 in your text is um all knowledge resolves itself into probability and becomes at last of the same nature with that evidence which we employ in common life Right, so it just, it turns out there isn't such a big difference between A and B is the initial conclusion of the argument. We thought in demonstrative arguments, we, oh, sorry, you can't see what I'm pointing at. We thought in demonstrative arguments that we had complete certainty, whereas here we had something less, but it turns out that actually demonstrative arguments also, because of these secondary judgments, the conclusions are also just probable. Yes, Ethan. Um, so, uh, is Hume more skeptical of reason, uh, of, of, of reason, or um, I'm, I'm, I mean, of like, uh, I guess, of like reasoning, or like just like the the the, the idea of reason itself, like, 
well, like, is, is he skeptical to whether or not, like, there is an answer to, like, is 2 plus 2 equals 5 true? Or is it, like, there's no way to know if it's, you know, it might may or may not be, but we just don't know. Well, I mean, so first of all, and this is important, Hume isn't going to believe the skeptical conclusion. Or okay. isn't going to believe it stably, right? That is, he doesn't claim that he can go around doubting whether 2 plus 3 equals 5. Um, so he's going to, he talks, after he makes the argument, he talks about why we don't believe the conclusion. Um, but, um, but, it, but if the question is, what is the argument supposed to cast doubt on? Well, I mean, it doesn't directly lead to conclusion or lead to wonder whether there's such a thing as reason. Um, although if we believe there's such a thing as reason, then I guess we must have learned that from either demonstration or or through our senses, right? You know, or, or you know, by the imagination or whatever, just like everything else. So uh, I mean, I guess there would also we would also suspend judgment about that uh, if, if if we really could believe that the conclusion of the argument, but it like it doesn't aim directly at that, right? It's it aims at the conclusions that we think reason shows us are true. Like two plus three equals five. Does that does that answer the question? Or not? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's more of like how like how do we how do we know versus like is it actually the case or not? Uh, well, no, it's, I mean, okay, maybe I didn't understand the question because I thought you we were asking, are we, at, are we doubting whether there is such a thing as reason or are we doubting whether we can believe the conclusions of reason? Well, yeah, I guess maybe it's like, uh, is there such a thing as truth? Like, is there, is there oh. like, is there like an actual truth to whether two plus three equals five or is it? Oh, oh I see your yeah, yeah, I think I, I could have said that better or, or, or can we know what the truth is to that two plus three equals five? Okay. Well, okay. Those, those might be really different, right? Is there a truth yeah. versus can we know? I mean, right? Like at least in some cases, those are really different, right? Like you might yeah. think there's a there's a truth to how many hydrogen atoms there are in the sun, but you know, um, you can't know, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, uh, so. Again, I guess I would say it doesn't directly aim at undermining the distinction between truth and falsehood. But um, since if we believed it, we would be left without any standard to judge between truth and falsehood. Right? Remember in the in the inquiry when he talked about the three parts of the system, he said he was gonna he was gonna examine the origin of our judgments of true and false, uh, like beautiful and ugly and right and wrong. So, or blameworthy and, or praiseworthy and blameworthy. So mm -hmm. like, um, so yeah, I mean, if you were able to raise a general ske uh, skepticism of, and, and believe in a general skepticism about all the faculties that we're, we're supposed to be able to use for this, then, I mean, the distinction would be useless. And I mean, moreover, you would have suspend judgment even about things like the law of excluded middle, which says that everything has to be either true or false. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so again, it doesn't aim directly at that. It aims directly at judgments like this. And we assume that it's either true or false, right? And like, and to begin with, we think we know which because of reason. And and the and the first step was well we're not sure which, but it's true in the end when I, I describe the rest of the argument it's it's going to turn out that yeah we have no more reason to believe it's true than to believe it's false, and then when you reach that conclusion about every individual judgment like this you know the the concept of true and false will no longer be useful, if you could believe that. <laughs> Yeah, Aiden. Um, 
does Hume go into aesthetics and that sort of field in this book? Or uh, were you talking about some like, uh, I don't know, with the beauty and ugly thing, were you talking about something that he talks about in a different book or? Well, he talks that. about it in the parts of the book we're not reading. <laughs> we're, okay, I understand. We're reading it's from book one on the understanding, so he doesn't talk about it. But, but when you mentioned the, the different parts of his system, at the, in the introduction to the inquiry, he, he mentioned that too. Um, I think, I actually knows something he says that makes me wonder if I'm right about this, but I think those are supposed to be, you know, the true and false is supposed to co correspond to part one on the understanding. Be beautiful and ugly is supposed to correspond to part two on the passions. And, uh, you know, right and wrong or praiseworthy and blameworthy is supposed to co correspond to part three on morals. I think that's right. In any case, uh, th yeah, so he does. He does have a famous and interesting theory of aesthetics, but we're not getting to that in this course. <laughs> um, okay, so let me go on with, with what this argument is here, unless there are more questions. Um, okay. Um, Right, so again, the first step is just reduces our certainty and demonstrative arguments and puts them on the same level as our other judgments. Um, but then the problem comes when we reflect on the second judgment. So now we say judgment three, is the judgment two is probably correct. You know, because after all, uh, you know, we do make mistakes in uh, like judging how reliable our faculties are. We can be overconfident, we can be underconfident um, for various reasons. Um, and uh, so it's reasonable to take a step back and say, okay, are you really sure that this is a case where um, you're almost certain to be right? And I mean, again, the answer is gonna be, yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> Right? Like, I'm pretty sure it's not some kind of weird overconfidence that leads me to think that, that I usually do simple additions correctly, but that it's, you know, I've correctly assessed the evidence. So, like, again, now since this second judgment is a judgment of probability, we're asking not whether you did a demonstration correctly, but whether you did an, you formed a correct empirical conclusion based on cause and effect. Um, so, you know, but yeah, I think I, I think I probably did, but well, I know I can make mistakes about that. So this judgment's not completely certain. And Hume claims that every step, so this is maybe a little bit harder to see, that at every step like this, the certainty of the initial judgment gets reduced. Um, right, this is on page 233. Um, let's see how things are. See, this is how I know it's on page 233 in the other edition because I wrote the page numbers in the margin. All right. Um, but this decision, though it should be favorable to our preceding judgment, being founded only on probability, must weaken still farther our first evidence.
right? So that's that's the claim that that um, even that even though like this decision will probably be favorable, right? It will say, yeah, I'm probably right. First of all, it's going to reduce the probability of this one a little bit. I mean, that's obvious, right? That's the whole point. But Hume claims it's going to reduce our certainty in the first one too. So, I mean, I I think the reason for that is that, uh, you know, as I said, like we could have made a mistake either way in the second judgment. I could have been overconfident or underconfident when I made the second judgment. But, um, but now if I ask how certain I should be about this, I kind of like I have to take into account the worst case scenario here. So um, the fact that I might have like um, underestimated my certainty is not really relevant. It's the, sorry, yeah, the fact that I, it's the fact that I might have overestimated my certainty that's relevant. So therefore, every one of these judgments, and of course, you can see how there's going to be a potentially infinite series of them. Um, every one of them reduces the certainty of the first judgment by some amount, some non-zero amount. And therefore, Hume says, my initial certainty, initially I was completely certain that two plus three equals five. After I carry out, after I carry out these judgments, it will be reduced to zero. Now, I mean, um, on the surface, that's not actually obvious. Like maybe it will tend asymptotically to something, right? So like my initial certainty was one, maybe it will, it will do this. And this might be really high. I mean, I've drawn it low so you can see it, but it might like, this might be 0.999 or something, right? Um, so like, but for the skeptical conclusion, we need to reduce the certainty to zero, right? That's suspension of judgment. Um, I mean, Certainty of zero, I guess, means probability of 0.5. This is always like a confusing thing. But in any case, um, right, because if we say the probability is zero, that means I'm certain it's not true. <laughs> um, but but think of this as the certainty. So like I, here, I'm certain. If I got to zero, I would be not certain at all. Um, so. Um, so to, I think, to get the conclusion, you need this other step, which Hume explicitly fills in. This is also on page 233. Um, no finite object can subsist under a decrease repeated in infinitum. And even the vastest quantity which can enter into human imagination must in this manner be reduced to nothing. So um, this is consistent with what Hume says about spatial and temporal quantities, right? Because I think what he means is, I think what he means is, not just that after an infinite series of judgments, it would go to zero, which would mean it never goes to zero, right? So like, even if it looks like this, it's never actually zero until I finish an infinite series of judgments, which of course I can't finish because it's infinite. So that would still re not exactly lead to the result of zero, but I think Hume thinks that in this quantity here, even though, right, this is not an extensive quantity, it's an intensive quantity, as I say, 
my the degree of certainty that I have in this uh, the results of this argument. Um, why is this coming out crooked? Is it because the camera is? Yeah, it look right either. Plus, it's hidden. All right. Sorry, I'm going to erase this. All right. Draw it here. So, right, I, what I was asking was, I don't know if you could see before, what I was asking was, why not think that um, it gets smaller and smaller forever, but never goes to zero? And in fact, doesn't perhaps doesn't even approach zero and go to zero in the limit. So I think Hume thinks that uh, that just as in spatial quantities or temporal quantities, that is extensive quantities. So in um, intensive quantities, uh, there's always a smallest amount you can take off. So it doesn't really look like that continuous line. It looks like, well, I mean, actually, it has to it has to go down by some multiple of that smallest part. I'm not drawing them the same, which is unfortunate, but. And you can see that something like this has to go to zero after a finite number of steps, right? You're always taking off some finite amount from the quantity you started with, no matter how small it is, after some finite number of judgments, this will actually go to zero. It won't just approach zero. So it might be judgment number eight or number eight million or whatever, but at some point you will have you you know you'll be so close to this to the axis here that um, there's only one of those indivisible parts left, and then you know in the next judgment your certainty goes to zero because it has to become less. And it can't become less than this except by going to zero. So, um, why I think so, it seems that Hume does think that. And there's other places that, that make it seem, I mean, even the way he states, states the principle here no finite quantity, et cetera, et cetera. And there's other places where he seems to say this about other, well, I mean, like, for example, when he says that uh, um, there must be a smallest difference in shade between different colors. I mean, in those cases, the specific arguments he used in part two, which were, you know, which had to do with space and time, maybe are not going to work. Not all of them are going to apply anyway. But he see, but at least some of them he thinks apply to quantities in general. And you know, I think I probably has something to do with like um, how he thinks an infinite number of things can be ordered. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details about it. Um, so anyway, um, and and well, I, I should say one thing about that. And do we know that he's wrong about the way infinitely many things can be ordered? Well, not really. I mean, um, We we can prove that that a like a continuous line is possible, but only by making an assumption that basically says that a continuous time is possible. Um, that I think that's the way this works when you look into the axioms of set theory. Um, okay, well, in any case, um, Hume's skeptical solution. 
So what is Hume's solution to the, I mean, skeptical solution? It's uh, the skeptical solution, I'm calling it that because it's very similar to what he called the skeptical solution to skeptical doubts in the um, inquiry, right? He said, um, uh, I'm not going to give you a reason to believe it, but I'm going to explain why you believe it, even though I give you a reason against it. And that why no reasons are going to be effective here. Um, that's the same thing he does here. Um, and um, and you know, it works like this. He says that this judgment is very natural and normal, right? Like after I do a demonstration, the first thing I wonder is, oh, did I get it right? Um, this judgment is a little bit more difficult to focus on. It's complicated, right? I mean, I made it seem simple by, by, um, by using this abbreviation here, judgment two is probably correct, right? But what it, you know, if you were to spell it out, like to try to understand what you're trying to decide about here, you're trying to decide how likely is it that I'm right about how likely it is that two plus three equals five. So it's kind of complicated. It's like hard to focus on. He says it's a little bit unnatural and we don't do it as often as this one, right? Like most of the time we stop we, with just saying, okay, am I usually reliable about this? Yeah, I think so. And we go on. But, you know, in special circumstances or like if we've just been reading about cognitive biases or whatever, we might try this one too. But then like the ones after this, Hume says, we practically never engage in and they're very hard to, to think about. They become more and more complicated. Um, and so he says that, you know, the, the laws of logic, so to speak, treat all these judgments. Now, again, it's not really the laws of logic after this first one, right? Because they're all really about probability. But anyway, the, the laws of what's reasonable to believe give the same force to each of these judgments. So we should treat them all as on the same level in some sense of should. And therefore we should end up like, that is if we were completely rational, even in this extended sense of rational, which includes reasoning about cause and effect, if we were completely rational, that is, if the only thing that determined how the effect of a judgment on us was what the laws of logic say about it, we would carry out all these judgments and we would, re and we would get to certainty zero. But as a matter of fact, the way we actually are, the force of these judgments diminishes as we go on because we can't, we have a hard time thinking about them. So, um, and it, and Hume says it decreases really quickly, actually. So, and so presumably the point is that it decreases more quickly than the certainty of judgment one decreases, right? So the certainty of judgment one, you know, goes to zero somewhere out here if we follow the laws of logic. But the force of the laws of logic goes to zero much sooner than that. <laughs> In fact, it may go to zero almost immediately, like after the first few judgments. So that's the solution. So the reason we don't believe the conclusion, which is that we should suspend judgment as to whether two plus three equals five, um, is not because there's any flaw in the argument, but because it's not the kind of argument that um, produces belief in us, given the way our mind works. And, you know, I think like when you say we should believe this, you mean kind of like abstracting from certain things we know about human beings, we would ex we'd expect you to believe that. 
But in real life, you shouldn't expect people to believe that, and they won't. Yeah, Aiden. So the reason why you shouldn't apply skepticism to two plus three equals five is because you know before applying that skepticism that that won't change people's belief well no i mean it won't change your but it's not that you shouldn't it it's that you you won't right i mean I, there, there there is something a little bit tricky about this you know because like if it weren't for this solution it seems like you could avoid going through all these steps you could just say, oh, I foresee in advance that the certainty is going to go to zero, right? Uh, like, I don't know how many steps, but I might as well reduce it to zero right away, right? But, but that's because you foresee what would happen if you carried out the steps, but your, your foresight is wrong, right? He says that isn't what would happen if you carried out those steps. Um, and um, um, so, like, yeah, there is a there is a kind of weird complication here having to do with what I just said that, that Hume doesn't directly address. I don't think it's an objection. It's just the situation is more a little more complicated. I mean, the point is like, so we're not going to come to suspend judgment by actually carrying out all these steps. So the question is. Can't, why can't we suspend judgment by thinking that we would reach zero if we carried out all those steps? Um, I mean, I think they, so like I said, Hume doesn't like separate those things out here. Um, but I think the answer is that, um, there's kind of two steps here. Maybe Hume does separate it actually, maybe I'm being unfair to him. Like the first step says, um, well, uh, here's an argument that shows that you shouldn't believe in, you should suspend judgment about everything, like two plus three equals five. But notice that you don't believe the answer of that, right? That you, you don't suspend judgment. You still think two plus three equals five. <laughs> I mean, maybe at the moment you're focusing on the argument, your certainty diminishes, but as soon as you go out into the world again, you know, and you're like um, checking your bill to see if you paid the right amount or whatever, you're gonna go right back to being certain that two plus three equals five. So um, so at this point, the, the, the conclusion is, see, like reason just doesn't have the authority to um, undermine itself this way. Why? Because, because there's more powerful forces from the imagination that are going to prevent us from ever believing the conclusion. So, and I think Hume says that at one point without going into detail about what those forces are. And then there's someone objects to him and says, well, wait, but like, according to you, this whole thing also happens by the imagination, actually. So um, like whether it's reason or imagination, this should still happen. Why tell us why this doesn't happen to him? And then his answer is, well, actually, this is what the imagination would do if the like general rules about reasoning for cause and effect were the only thing that determined the force of an argument. But since it's not, the imagination doesn't do that. I, I don't know if that helped or made it more confusing, what I just said. Right? That was totally an answer to my question. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I, have to, I have to pick up the pace here because I have to uh, get to skepticism with regard to the senses. Um, yeah, so actually there was something I'm gonna say about this, but I'm gonna skip it and just 
So are there more, because this is basically the end of the skepticism with regard to reason. Are there questions about it before I go on to skepticism with regard to the senses? Okay. Um, so in this part two, that is, it's part two, but in this part also, <laughs> um, Hume begins by claiming that we're not going to believe the result. So, um, that is, that the skeptical conclusion isn't actually going to take, so to speak. Um, this is on page 238 in the Penguin edition. Um, thus, the skeptic, the skeptic still continues to reason and believe, even though he asserts that he cannot defend his reason by reason. That, I think, you know, that's, that's like a good summary of what the, a skeptical solution is. I don't claim that I can defend my, my certainty by reason, but I come to understand why uh, no amount of reasoning is going to destroy it either. So, that, right, so thus the skeptic still continues to reason and believe, even though he asserts that he cannot defend his reason by reason, and by the same rule, he must assent to the principle concerning the existence of body, though he cannot pretend by any arguments of philosophy to maintain its veracity. Right, so that's the, that's the transition between the two sections, and he's saying the result in one case is just it's going to be just like the result in the other case. Um, I'm going to give you a skeptical argument that's supposed to show that you shouldn't believe your senses, which, as I said, this believe your senses here means um, like. Um, believe in things that Locke calls sensitive knowledge and similar things about remote objects. Um, believe that bodies exist corresponding to your impressions. Um, so, you know, he says, I'm, right, I'm going to give you an argument that's supposed to show that you shouldn't have any certainty, that you should suspend judgment about all those things. But um, here to that conclusion, you won't actually believe that conclusion. You'll continue to believe in the existence of bodies just like you always did. Um, but in the end, it's going to turn out that it's actually a little bit different here in this section. So this is on page, bottom of page 266 in the Penguin edition. Having thus given an account of all the systems, both popular and philosophical, with regard to external existences, I cannot forbear giving vent to a certain sentiment. This is a, this is a typical Hume trick. I might have even mentioned this before. Like, as if, um, at this mo like as if we're listening to his thought process, and at this moment he can't restrain himself from giving vent to a certain sentiment. Well, I mean, like of course, you know, if he didn't want to give vent to it, he could have written it down and then erased it before he sent it to the publisher, right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, it's it's a like that's a fictional visit. The Hume there is a fictional character who's unable to restrain himself and has to give vent to the sentiment. And the same goes for what he says afterwards. So I cannot forbear giving vent to a certain sentiment which arises upon reviewing those systems. I've, I've begun this subject with premising that we ought to have an implicit faith in our senses and that this would be the conclusion I should draw from the whole of my reasoning. But to be ingenuous, that is to be honest, I feel myself at present of a quite contrary sentiment. 
and am more inclined to repose no faith at all in my senses, or rather imagination, than to place in it such an implicit confidence. Right? So um, uh, he's saying, like, when I began the section, I believed what I said there, which is that this is going to be just like the case of reason. Um, you're not going to, you're going to continue to trust your senses no matter what I say. But he says, but now that I'm at the end of the section, having gone through all those arguments, I find that I feel the opposite, like I shouldn't trust your senses. So again, right, that's a, we're not really hearing Hume's thought process in real time, right? This is a book that he wrote and published, <laughs> you know, wrote and edited and published. It's not like, you know, like if he had really changed his mind between the beginning of the section and the end of the section, he could have gone back to the beginning of the section and erased what he wrote there and wrote something else, right? So, but like we're listening in to a fictitious character. Um, it's um, pretty much exactly like what goes on in Descartes' meditations. It's just like not quite so explicit, but we're, there's like a fiction that someone is sitting in their chamber going through certain arguments and we're listening on um and among other things we get to know how they feel at each point um okay but so why why doesn't he say that at the end of the reason section he does say it here um i think i think the difference is because the skepticism with regard to reason um was properly speaking a uh, skeptical argument that is, as I said, it tend to, tended to reduce our certainty from one to zero or the probability from one to 0 0.5, right? Like now we consider it equally probable that two plus three equals five and that it doesn't equal five. Um, uh, but the argument in these sections will turn out in the end to show that um, um, there's something incoherent about what we believe about external objects. So that's why when you get to the end of the section, you can't really say, oh, but I'm going to go back to believing what I believed before anyway, because you've just shown that there is no such thing to believe, right? It's, there is no coherent belief. <laughs> um, nevertheless, Hume says in the continuation of that passage, give it some time <laughs> and you'll start believing in it again and you won't, and, and like, you won't notice you'll forget that there's no such thing to believe, <laughs> that there's no consistent thing to believe here. So it sort of has the same moral and sort of doesn't. It's more disconcerting. Okay, so what, what is the argument? Um, and like before I discuss the details of the argument, I should, um, emphasize, as Hume does, that there's actually two different beliefs about, right, this, the skepticism with regard to the senses is skepticism with regard to the existence of what we take to be the objects of the sen senses, the continued and independent objects, right? These are the two features of them that Hume Um, singles out. They're continued, meaning that we think they're there even when our impression is interrupted, right? So if I'm looking at this pen and I close my eyes and I open them, I don't think the pen disappeared while my eyes, that is the pen itself, I don't think it was annihilated while my eyes were closed, even though I had no impression of it then. That's Continued existence and independent existence means I don't think it depends on my mind for its existence. I think it would exist whether my mind existed or not. Now, I mean, Hume says these two things go together. You can't believe one without the other. 
um, I mean, um, that's more or less true. I think there might be some things you could worry about here, but basically, right, like if it continues to exist, even when I'm not perceiving it, it must not be dependent on my perceiving it anyway. Um, and on the other hand, if it's independent of my mind, then just the fact that I don't see it anymore shouldn't affect its existence. So it should continue to exist. So, you know, at least in general, of course, there could always be a special case where there's a little trigger put, attached to my eyelids. And then, you know, when I close my eyes, it explodes the pen. And then, there's a, you know, when I open my eyes, a new pen drops in. I think, Right, but like generally speaking, if if the pens are independent of my mind, then they should continue to exist even when I don't see them. Um, but there's, um, um, so that's what we're talking about, but it means two very different things depending on what you think the objects of the senses are. So Hume says there's two views about that. One is the vulgar view. Right, where vulgar just means common. It doesn't mean like bad manners or something like that. It's just synonymous with common. Um, so, I mean, it could be kind of derogatory, but only in the way common is or could be, right? Like, oh, that's so common. <laughs> right. So, anyway, so the vulgar view is that. Um, the objects of my senses are the very thing that's present to the mind. Objects of my senses are immediately present to the mind. So this is a lot like Barclay's view, meaning that Hume is close to agreeing with Barclay about what the vulgar, that is what the common people believe. And Hume says, by the way, that um, who are the vulgar? Um, everyone, including the so-called learned or philosophers, most of the time. Right, like when they're not actually thinking about philosophy, they they're also the vulgar. So this is what we ordinarily believe. It's the common sense belief, and it's as I said, it's very close to Barclay's belief. Right, that what I see is um, when I see the pen, the impression that's immediately present to my mind is the pen. I mean. Again, that's a weird way of putting it. That's not the way the vulgar would normally put it, right? They would just say, when I see a pen, what I what my mind is perceiving is the pen. Not something else that represents the pen. Right? That's the philosophical view. Philosophical view is that there's a double existence. Right, so like, here's my mind. What I see is an impression or what I perceive, maybe see isn't the right word here, but what I perceive is an impression. And the impression stands for a real object outside my mind. So there's a double object, there's a double existence. Oops, you can't see that beautiful pen that I drew. <laughs> here it is, all right. So um, there's a double object. This is this is the the body, in this case a pen, right? So um, this is the philosophical view. Hume agrees with Barclay that this is a strange view that's foreign to common sense. This is Locke's view, of course, but not only Locke, Descartes, um, Spinoza and Leibniz, I guess. Not Barclay, obviously. <laughs> right? I mean, Aristotelians, at least later medieval Aristotelians, also believe something like this. Um, 
it's not not exactly the same, but anyway. Um, so uh, this is what Hume is calling the philosophical view. So this is just like Locke, and this is almost like Berkeley, except of course that Berkeley doesn't think that the immediate objects of our perception have these characteristics, right? Berkeley thinks that um, the pen is an idea or the, it's the kind of idea that Hume would call an impression in my mind. And that when I close my eyes and there's that idea or impression is not there anymore, there is no pen. But Hume, and, and Barclay thinks that's the common sense view. But Hume says, no, the common sense view is that the very thing that I immediately perceive by my mind continues to exist even when it's not in my mind. Yeah, Aiden, did you have another question? Um, what are the two words that are <laughs> after my sense, like, um... Should say my senses. Senses. Okay. Objects of my senses immediately. This word is immediately, and this word is present. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And this says to to the mind, or I guess it should should, should say to my mind. I don't know. I switch. <laughs> I switch uh, subjects in the middle. But anyway, um, right. So. Um, so the vulgar believe that the objects of my senses are immediately present to my mind, but they also believe that the objects of my senses are continued and independent. Whereas the philosophers believe that what's uh, immediately present to my mind is impressions, and they don't have a continued and independent existence, right? They're not continued because when I close my eyes, I don't have a pen impression anymore. And they're not independent because they're in my mind. They, um, um, what impressions there are depends on something about my mind. Um, so what do the philosophers think is has a continued independent existence? This thing, the body that's represented by my impression, right? So, when I close my eyes, the pen impression doesn't exist anymore, but the pen still exists. That's the philosophical view. So in this section, I mean, so like, and by the way, I already pointed out that in part two, when Hume isn't engaged in a skeptical argument, Hume proceeds throughout as if the philosophical view were correct, right? He distinguishes between uh, my impressions and their objects. And, he's, and, he, and he asserts things about it, like that the objects are much bigger than the impressions. <laughs> um, but here, the, you know, what he's headed for is that, and I guess, to summarize it, I could say that um, what he's headed for is this. The vulgar view is not incoherent. It could be true. We have no good reason to believe it. That is, we come to believe it for bad reasons. And we do have reasons to believe it's false. <laughs> Right, so the vulgar view is going to turn out to be um, conceivable, but unjustified and, in fact, false. Whereas this philosophical view is going to turn out, in the end, to be um, um, not self-consistent. Yeah, I think you can already see that in this section, but it becomes much clearer when he discusses in more detail the different versions of the philosophical view in upcoming sections. All right, so, I mean, so because of this, even though like this is the target in the end, 
Um, he actually, he spends most of his time discussing why the vulgar come to have this view. The, the conclusion of that part is that it's not for good reasons and therefore it's unjustified. Then briefly after that, he explains how we can tell that it's false. And he says that when we realize that it's false, that's what motivates the philosophical view. And then he explains why the philosophical view is actually worse than the vulgar view. Um, I feel like I'm not going to get to talk about all of this. So, um, but I'll at least start talking about how he thinks the vulgar view originates. So, um, So first of all, between these two, even though, again, Hume thinks that they mutually imply each other. So if you believe one, you have to believe the other and vice versa, or you should anyway. But, um, um, but, he, but he separates them because he thinks that we're um, led to believe one because we're first led to believe the other. Right, and the one we think we're led to believe first is continued existence. And then he thinks we come to believe in independent existence because continued existence implies independent existence. Right, so, I mean, he has a long argument about this. I'm not gonna go through the details of it, of like various faculties and what they could possibly make us believe or whatever, um, but, um, I'm just going to focus on the positive answer. How, why do we come to believe in continued existence? Um, So there's two different parts of the explanation. Apparently we need both of them. Although at first sight it might seem like they're two competing explanations. Um, so, um, but, so one explanation is that um, the impressions that we call external have a certain kind of order to them, a certain kind of regularity. So that is the ones we call external are the impressions of primary and secondary qualities, figure, quantity, color, et cetera, as opposed to the ones that we call internal like passions and pains and pleasures. So in that case, we, like, we don't think they continue when we don't feel them, he says. Maybe nowadays we do, maybe, Leibniz thinks they do, uh, you know, but um, but Locke, for example, certainly doesn't think they do, right? That, you know, and it is a little strange to say, like, um, the pain continued, but I couldn't perceive it anymore. But doesn't that mean there was no pain? He didn't perceive it. Um, so Hume says, what's the difference between these two groups? And he says, the answer is that the external ones have a certain kind of regularity, but it's a defective kind of regularity. So like the passions, passions also have a certain kind of regularity, but Hume says um, there's no missing pieces to their regularity, right? So like, I don't know what the, you know, but maybe like um, anger causes hatred or something like that. So suppose this is the regularity. Hume says that um, you see the whole pattern. Every time you feel anger, then you feel hatred. 
I mean, maybe unless something else interferes, right? But just then you see, then you have that perception too, right? It's all um, present to your mind, the whole thing you're calling regular. I think, you know, if, if, if this doesn't seem so obvious to us now that, that we don't believe that these continue even when we don't perceive them, it's probably because um, it probably agrees with Hume's conclusion. It's probably because we think there's missing pieces in this regularity too. But in any case, leaving that aside, here's the external impressions. Um, so they have a certain regularity, like for example, um, suppose I have the visible impression of a door closing. Regularity, or I guess I should do it the other way. Regularity, um, suppose I hear a door closing. So there's a sound of a door closing. The regularity is that whenever I hear that sound, there's also a visible impression of a door closing. So now, like, here's a first attempt at explaining why I believe that the door exists even when I don't see it. I hear the sound of the door closing, but I'm not facing the door, so I don't see a door closing. But I say, I've always observed this regularity in the past, so I'm going to assume that there's also a visible door closing, and I just don't perceive it. Like, so that's what you would first think. but um, but the truth is, you haven't always observed that. I mean, right now is an example of when you're not observing it, <laughs> right? You you hear that you hear that as we just started by saying you hear the sound of the door closing, but you don't see it. That's an exception to the regularity. So this regularity has exceptions unless you fill in missing pieces. Right, so like this, this regularity is an imperfect regularity in the sense that sometimes when you hear a door closing, you see a door closing, but other times you don't. Um, but if you assume that there are visible doors that you can't perceive, like when you're not facing them or when your eyes are closed or whatever, then you can fill them in and make the regularity perfect. Right, so it's actually, um, it's the, right, here we have, this is the situation where I'm facing the door. Here's the situation where I'm not facing the door. I have the sound, but I don't have the visible door closing. So the regularity is, is defective. It's not, this isn't completely regular, but if I assume that there's a, a visible door that I don't see, then um, I can make the regularity perfect. Um, so like that's what leads us to start thinking that a door is there, even though I don't, we don't see it. That it doesn't disappear when we're not looking at. It. Oh boy, I'm almost out of time. I guess I'm gonna have to talk about this at the beginning next week which will cause other problems, but um, but so I'll just wrap up this one thought and then I'll have to finish the rest of this on Tuesday, um, which is that, so you might think, oh, okay, this is just an example of our usual way of learning about cause and effect, right? It's custom. We've become used to seeing the door closing when we hear a door closing. And so we associate the two. And since we associate the two, now we get the sound again. We also we supply the visible door closing out of habit. And it takes like vivacity from the impression. And so we believe it. 
right? Because believing just means having that vivacious idea. So, um, but Hume says that's not sufficient to explain it because um, once again, you haven't always had those two impressions together. Sometimes you have one and you never have the other. Um, how strong is the regularity? How strong is the association? Well, it's exactly as strong as the actual regularity that you perceive. So he says it can never like give you a tendency to um, just by association to believe in a stronger regularity. Right, it's like suppose that half the time doors closed, I was I was facing them, and half the time the doors closed, I was facing away. So half the times I had this, and half the times I had this. So how strong is the association between these two? It's so to speak fifty percent, <laughs> right? So like, um, um, how strong do I think the regularity is? How strong do I believe the regularity is? I believe it happens half the time. <laughs> um, and so, um, but what I want to get to is I believe it happens 100% of the time and, um, and just the usual effects of custom will not be enough to explain that. Okay, I, um, I'm, I should say more about that, but I, I can't because we're out of time. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday, or, or perhaps in a few minutes if you're in the other class. <laughs> All right, bye. Uh